I remember as a boy, my father enjoyed classic films with rugged male leads. John Wayne, the Duke, and Clint Eastwood in those Western movies, Harrison Ford in the Indiana Jones series. And I loved watching those movies whenever my dad had them on the television. The Indiana Jones series in particular was very uh, impressionable on my mind. In fact, this is not related to the movies, but, but there was a time when I was a kid that as we were driving down the road, we saw this box on the side of the road and inside it were two abandoned black Labrador puppies, one boy and one girl. Cute, beautiful little dogs. I don't know why anybody would abandon these puppies. So, of course, we, we took them in and we cared for them for a little while until we found them a home. We already had a giant white lab who ate so much. And so I guess the thought of feeding two more was just too much. Uh, but Dad appropriately named those puppies Indy and Anna. Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade was the one that I remembered loving the most. That, that's the one where uh, Dr. Jones is chasing after the Holy Grail, the chalice from which Jesus supposedly drank at the Last Supper. If you've seen the movie, you will recall the, the scene near the end where Dr. Jones using his brilliant father's field notes, makes it through all of the obstacles to the room where the old knight is seated. And you remember him, right? He's been there like 500 years. And he is guarding all of these cups in this room, one of which is the Holy Grail. So Jones comes into this room searching for the Holy Grail, expecting to just find the one chalice. But when he gets there, he sees the final test is that he has to choose the right one from among many. If he chooses correctly, he will have eternal life and the healing powers of the Grail. But if not, We'll get there in a moment. So there was another in the room with Dr. Jones, you'll remember. Donovan was his last name. He also was searching for the grail, and he was going to make the first choice. Now, folks, I don't think I have to say spoiler alert when a movie came out in 1989. But if you haven't seen the movie, here comes the spoiler alert, okay? Okay. So Donovan is, is looking out at all of these cups, and he's got to choose the right one. And so he turns to his partner, I think her name was Elsie, and he says, you choose. Mistake. Man, you knew that was a mistake the first time you watched the movie, right? And she looks at all of these cups. Many of them are gold and silver, and very elaborate and ornate in their design. And she picks up this beautiful golden chalice, and she says, this is the one. This is the one. And Donovan says, oh, yeah, you're right. That's the one that Jesus drank from at the supper. And so he dips that chalice in the water, and he drinks, and he is stricken with this immediate, powerful cinematic effect and his flesh just rots off of his bones in this grotesque fashion. And I remember as a boy, I thought it was the coolest thing ever. <laughs> so now it's time for Dr. Jones to choose his chalice and drink. Which one is he going to pick? He doesn't turn to Elsie. Smart man. She's 0 for 1. He chooses the one chalice that is different from all the rest. He chooses the one made of wood. 
And you remember the line, don't you? The cup of a carpenter. And he takes that simple vessel, unattractive, easily overlooked by the beauty of the others that surround it. And he dips it in the water and he drinks and he lives. The apostles of Jesus were vessels of God. They were given the charge of carrying the gospel throughout the world. They were privileged to be chosen by Christ to share his message with the world. And Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, which I'll read once I get out of 1 Corinthians chapter 3. All right, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul says in verse 12, Therefore, having such hope, we use great boldness in our speech. We are the chosen messengers of Christ who are proclaiming the new covenant of Christ. And because of the hope that he has given to us, we speak boldly. We speak with great confidence. In verse 7, he says, If the ministry of death in letters engraved on stones, that's talking about the law of Moses. The law of Moses that Moses ushered in, the old covenant. If the law and the ministry of death, why is it called the ministry of death? Because when you broke the law, you deserved death. The ministry of death came in letters engraved on stones, but notice Paul says it came with glory. So that the sons of Israel could not look intently at the face of Moses because of the glory of his face fading as it was. How will the ministry of the Spirit fail to be even more with glory? You see, Paul is setting forth a contrast. The ministry of death and the ministry of the Spirit. The old and the new covenants. He says in verse 9, if the ministry of condemnation, that's the same one as the ministry of death. If the ministry of condemnation has glory, how much more does the ministry of righteousness abound in glory? That's the ministry of the Spirit that Paul and the apostles are preaching. And so because we are able to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, we do it with great boldness. In chapter 4, Paul tells us in verse 7 that we have this treasure in earthen vessels. You see, Paul believed that the apostles were stewards of a great treasure. And that treasure that they were stewards of was the gospel of Jesus Christ. But he says in verse 7 that this treasure is contained inside earthen vessels. I want to think about that phrase this morning. The treasure in an earthen vessel. And much like that simple wooden grail that Dr. Jones drank from, the apostles of Jesus Christ were simple vessels who were carrying the gospel throughout the world. A vessel. A vessel is used to carry something. That's all it is. It can be made of anything. It can carry anything, but a vessel carries something from one place to another. So a ship is a vessel which carries people or products. An inkwell is a vessel which contains ink for your quill. Not that anybody uses those anymore. A barrow 
is a cart that's used to carry material. And when you put two handles and a wheel on it, it becomes a wheelbarrow. It's a vessel that is used to carry something. A mug is a vessel which carries that heaven-sent, amazingly aromatic, tingling to the taste buds, endless energy-giving elixir known as liquid life or coffee. It's a vessel, and it has contents. The apostles were vessels, and they were carrying a treasure. We know from the context that the treasure that's under consideration is the gospel of Christ. We know that because of things that are said back in chapter 3, where he gives that contrast between the ministry of death and the ministry of condemnation, the old law, the old covenant of Moses, and the new covenant of Christ. But as we come into chapter 4, it's even more plain than that. When he says in verse 3, And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The gospel that we preach might be veiled, he says. Then in verse 4, speaking of these people whose eyes are veiled and covered, he says, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. That's the treasure that the apostles are carrying. It is the gospel of Christ that they preach. So when Paul has given this contrast in chapter 3, old versus new, death versus life in the spirit, then in chapter 4 and verse 1, he says, Therefore, since we have this ministry, what ministry? Well, chapter 3 used language like verse 8, the ministry of the Spirit, the ministry of life, the gospel, the new covenant of Christ. We have this ministry, he says, and as we have received mercy, we do not lose heart. The apostles were, were given the great commission by the Lord. Go make disciples of all nations. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Carry this message and broadcast it all over the world. This is our ministry, he says. Well, how did they go about their work? Well, in verse 2, he says, But we have renounced the things hidden because of shame not walking in craftiness or adulterating the word of God, but by the manifestation of truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. We conducted ourselves properly before you. We showed others as we were preaching to them that we cared for them, that we loved their soul, that we wanted them to come to know Christ. We weren't out to take advantage of people. We weren't out trying to... to, to You ever struggle to find the right word? I'm struggling right now. We weren't out to use people, to fool or deceive people. Our motivations, our intentions were right. But there are many who can't hear the things that we're saying. This is what we read in verses 3 and 4 where it says, The God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel. Not everyone we've preached to, Paul says, is hearing us. Not everyone that we have preached to is accepting our message. Satan has blinded them. He has deluded them. And we are trying to enlighten. We are trying to open their eyes. But not everyone is hearing us. So in verse 6, For God who said, Light shall shine out of darkness, 
God is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. The very same God who created in the beginning, when there was nothing but darkness and emptiness, said, let there be light, and there was. The same God, Paul says, has shown in our hearts. And he has made it so that we have the ministry to carry that light into the heart of every man. And so, verse 7, we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Your version might say, we have this treasure in jars of clay. These men have the world's most valuable treasure to carry. A message that is so wonderful that God wants every person alive to hear it. He wants every man to open his heart and receive it. He wants every woman to hear the gospel and believe it. He wants this veil that is over their eyes to be lifted so that they can see and that they can be saved by Christ. Now, I want to think about this idea with you. If that's what God wants, what would be the most effective way to get that result? There's somewhere around 8 billion people on the earth today. God wants every one of them to know Christ. How is he going to get that done? What would be the most efficient, the most effective way to reach a world full of people? How might he get the message out in a way that emphatically makes an impact on the listeners? So you're God. You have at your disposal anything and everything that you could conceive of possibly using. How are you going to do the job? Here's some options. You might look around and you might say, you know, I am surrounded by a myriad of angels. I'm just going to start sending angels out to people. And the angels can make appearances to men and women all over the earth and tell them, believe in the gospel of Jesus. So I'm just going to flood the world with angels. God has used angels in the past to announce good news, hasn't he? Abraham, Sarah, you're going to have a child. John the Baptist, his birth was announced by an angel. The Lord Jesus, his birth was announced by angels. God has done this before. Angels have throughout Scripture been used by God as messengers to convey His will. Would it not have been an incredible sight for people to look up into the skies and see heavenly hosts of angels descending to the earth carrying the message of the gospel of Christ? That would have been something to see, wouldn't it? But that's not what God chose to do when he wanted to get his message out. Okay, so we're not going to do angels. What else could we do? Well, what if I myself go and tell people and the Holy Spirit, a member of the Godhead, God himself 
in the Holy Spirit will just come and tell people directly. I will speak to people directly and tell them what to do to be saved. Has the Holy Spirit ever spoken to people before? Sure. The Bible has a number of examples where that happens. That would really get their attention, right? And yet, that's not what God chose to do. So rather than using supernatural means, God says, I'm going to use natural means. I don't want to use heavenly messengers. I'm going to use earthly ones. I'm going to use earthen vessels, not heavenly vessels. So God uses ordinary men, Peter, Paul, John, James, 12 ordinary men beset with weaknesses but men who were made strong by Christ. He uses them as his vessels to carry his message all over the world. He uses them, as Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 11, to go out and persuade men. Let's pick up our reading in verse 8. Of chapter 4. Speaking about himself and the other apostles, he says, We are afflicted in every way, but we are not crushed. Perplexed, but not despairing. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying about in the body the dying of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. For we who live are constantly being delivered over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death works in us, but life in you. Think about the great challenges that the apostles faced as they carried the gospel throughout the world. Just the life of Paul illustrates. There were times he was on ships that wrecked out at sea. There were multiple times he was put into prison, he was beaten, he was confronted by authorities, he stood trial before unjust and wicked men. All of that because of the ministry of the Spirit that he was given by Christ. And yet, he says, with all of these things that we've faced, we're afflicted in every way, but but we've not given up. We have been beaten, but we're not destroyed. We have suffered a lot, but we have not quit. And these challenges, Paul says in verse 15, have had a great effect. All things are for your sakes, so that the grace which is spreading to more and more people may cause the giving of thanks to abound to the glory of God. All of these things that we've suffered, it's been for you. And our sufferings have caused grace to spread farther and wider. Now you look at this that Paul writes and you think earthen vessels, human messengers, And all of these things that they've had to deal with, why is this what God chose to use? These human messengers, these human vessels, like like the cup made of wood that Dr. Jones picked up, may not seem to be best. It wasn't the most beautiful cup in the room. It wasn't the most elaborate or the most, most ornate. It wasn't the most expensive, but it was the right one. Why 
why would God use men? Weak and foolish as they may be at times. To be the vessels that he uses to carry the greatest treasure the world has ever known. Why would he do that? In short, the simple answer is because God doesn't think like we do. And Paul says that in chapter 4 and verse 7. We have this treasure in earthen vessels so that the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not from ourselves. Why does God use weak and fragile human beings? Because it's the treasure of the gospel that deserves the attention, not the man preaching the gospel. It is the God who created the gospel plan. It is the Christ who enacted the gospel plan who deserves the praise, not the speaker, not the messenger. So let's go to the book of Acts together. I want to show you an interesting pattern that you see in the book of Acts. And, and we're just going to quickly survey three examples, three things in the book of Acts that, that show God's process unfolding. So let's go to Acts chapter 8. Let's start there. Acts chapter 8. As the gospel of Christ is spreading in the first century, it was earthen vessels who made it go. It was the apostles. It was Peter and Paul who were making it go. But what the book of Acts plainly tells us is that God was working to help them. It wasn't just their efforts. But in Acts chapter 8, and in verse 26, an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Get up and go south to the road that descends from Jerusalem to Gaza. An angel comes and speaks to Philip, the preacher. And he says, Start traveling down this road. There's a man out there who needs to hear the gospel. Well, wait a minute. Why not just send the angel to the man who's traveling down the road? Why are we sending Philip? Why are we adding another step to the process? Just send the heavenly messenger to the Ethiopian eunuch. But that's not what God chose to do. An angel, a heavenly messenger, visited an earthen vessel and said, go here and speak to this man. Look at chapter 10. You see the exact same thing happening. We have Cornelius in chapter 10, and it says in the, verse 3, about the ninth hour of the day, Cornelius clearly saw in a vision an angel who had just come in, and the angel speaks to Cornelius. We're not going to read the text, but I want you to notice that the angel who visited Cornelius doesn't say, Cornelius, listen, here's what you need to do to become a Christian. You need to believe the gospel of Jesus Christ and you need to go and be baptized. And that's not what he did. The angel came and he said, Cornelius, in the next town over here is a preacher whose name is Peter. You need to send for him. Well, why? Why not just have the angel tell Cornelius what to do? Because that's not the process that God chose to use. The angel was involved, but the angel said, Cornelius, send for Peter. Now, in this same chapter, the Holy Spirit has a role. The Holy Spirit speaks to Peter. And he says, Peter, in Caesarea is a man who is lost. 
His name is Cornelius. Go preach to him. And Peter does. You see, these heavenly messengers are working behind the scenes. But it was an earthen vessel named Peter who brought the message to Cornelius. If you'll flip to chapter 11, notice what Peter says about this. Peter says in verse 13 that he, that's Cornelius, he reported to us how he had seen the angel standing in the house and saying, send to Joppa and have Simon, who is also called Peter, brought here. And he, notice what the angel says, okay? Verse 14 is important. And he, Peter, will speak words to you by which you will be saved. Why not just have the angel speak the words that Cornelius needs to hear? I don't really know the answer to that. But that's not what God chose to do. God chose earthen vessels to carry his message. Finally, chapter 16. Let's look at one other case here that I think is interesting. This is not a case of conversion, but this is an instance where the Holy Spirit, a heavenly messenger, is directing the earthen vessels. Acts chapter 16 and verse 6, Luke writes, they, that's Paul and his company, they passed through the Phrygian and Galatian region, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. They start to go to Asia, but the Holy Spirit says, nope, don't go over there, go here instead. Now, verse 7, and after they came to Mysia, they were trying to go into Bithynia, and the Spirit of Jesus did not permit them. So once again, they're trying to go over here, but the Holy Spirit says, nope, don't go there, go here instead. The Holy Spirit is directing the steps of the preachers. But notice the Holy Spirit is not doing the preaching. It's the earthen vessels who are doing the preaching. So why earthen vessels? I can't say anything to that other than what we've seen in chapter 4 and verse 7 of 2 Corinthians. God uses the humble, the weak, and the broken clay vessels so that the message will shine through and not the messenger. God is glorified through earthen vessels. The gospel of Christ is enabled to shine more brightly when the messenger is not the focal point. The humble vessel brings honor to its treasure. And when the messenger is honored, the gospel treasure is hidden. So with that in mind, a couple of quick thoughts as we close. Here's the first one. Do you view the gospel as a treasure or as a trinket? You have trinkets in your house? I know you do. Or, or in your RV. You have trinkets. We all do. What do we do with a trinket? A trinket is something that we put on the shelf, and maybe we walk by it every day. We see it every day, but we don't really think about it. Occasionally, when someone new comes over to our house, they might notice it and ask about it, and so then we'll pull it off the shelf and we'll reminisce a little bit, and we'll say, oh, yeah, this was given to me by my great aunt so-and-so, and I don't really know what it is, or I don't really know what to do with it even, but I just can't bring myself to get rid of it because of who gave it to me. It has a sentimental value, or whatever the case may be. That's a trinket. It's not a treasure. A treasure is something we prize and we value greatly. We protect it. We put it in a safe place. Maybe even a safety deposit box at the bank vault in town. 
If someone were to ask me, Ben, what do you value most in life? Would my answer be the gospel of Jesus Christ? Would that be your answer? I, I don't know, Ben. My, my treasure is my family. Well, of, of course you love your family. But the way you raise your children, the way you interact with your grandchildren, the way that you influence your family, is that not all affected first by the gospel treasure? If our treasure is anything worldly in its nature, we've missed it. We are off the mark, woefully off the mark. Beloved, the, the gospel of Christ is the most meaningful treasure there is. It affects everything in my life. I want you to think about that. I want you to value the gospel of Christ more than anything else. Do you see the gospel as a treasure or a trinket that you just Look to every now and then when you need it. When you're going through a crisis, you pull it off the shelf and you dust it off and you smile at it and then you put it back when you get to the other side. Don't do that with the gospel. Treasure it. And then here's the second thing. Will you allow God to use you as an earthen vessel for his glory? Will you take that wondrous treasure and carry that to someone who needs it. If the gospel really is a treasure to us, then we will not have trouble finding the will to try and tell others about it. And those others that we need to reach, it might be your kids. If your children are young, or if they've never obeyed the gospel, be a vessel for them. That, that's who you need to take the gospel to. Maybe it's coworkers and friends or neighbors. If you and I will be humble Christians, as we are called to be, then the gospel will shine through our attitude of humility and service. And as we, as, as Jim talked to us about this morning, as he reminded us about the Good Samaritan, who is my neighbor? Everyone. And if we will reach out and if we will be good and be kind and we will serve and if we will love our fellow man, God will use us as his earthen vessel for his glory. Thank you. I appreciate your attention this morning. Joe, I think we've had three sermons in a row with no PowerPoint. Isn't that something? And nobody's asleep. That's great. Thank you. Thank you for the way you listen. The gospel treasure is a treasure for all. And we want every man and every woman to have that treasure. Do you have that in your life this morning? If you don't, we want to help you with that. We want you to know Christ more than anything else. And if we can help you with that, we want you to come and make that known to us right now as we stand and sing together.